Welcome to First. I'm Nichelle Poston along with Mark Eichmann and Shirley Min. The term fake news has brought all kinds of emotions this year. It also could become a teachable moment. We also have a historical moment this week. Leo and Jimmy's has been a Wilmington restaurant landmark for decades. A new chapter begins this week. And the next chapter is being written for the organ at the Episcopal Church of Saints Andrew and Matthew. Listen to the music and feel good about what was accomplished. First, your public media news magazine starts now. The presidential milestone known as the first 100 days is complete. And while there will be debates over what was accomplished, there is one phrase that was common during the last three months fake news. Delaware education reporter Chris Barris joins me now. And Chris, fake news is being used as a teachable moment, right? It sure is, Shirley. It's on the agenda in Delaware from the university level to high schools. So we chose the topic as this week's first look. A Texas town was not quarantined after a family tested positive for Ebola. President Obama never signed an executive order banning the Pledge of Allegiance. Nor did the Pope endorse Donald Trump for president. They're fake news, fabrications, make-believe. Yet those falsehoods and hundreds of others have spread virally on social media and the Internet. In a sense, you can't kind of trust them because it's, it's all personal beliefs and opinions that are being written on all of these um, big uh, journalism posts like that, the Wall Street, all that. Um, so you can, you can take bits and pieces from each different article that you have and kind of make your own um, definition of it. UD student Darola Balarinwa isn't as cynical, but the peddling of fake news disturbs her. But when you think of it, of like the impact on society, it's really not funny because some of them have like real life impacts. Fake news has become President Trump's go-to phrase when he disagrees with a story. I'm not going to give you a question. You are fake news. The rhetoric has reached absurd proportions. One spokesman's claim that crowds at Trump's inaugural were the biggest in history were later described by another on his team as alternative facts. When you have two photos of an inauguration crowd, <laughs> yes, I get that. and one has hardly any people, and the other one has over a million people, and it wasn't there's raining. no alternative fact there. A determined backlash against a post-truth world has begun, however. The University of Delaware's library now has a web page to help students navigate the clutter. Consider the source. Check your biases. See if other outlets carry the same story. We've had a splintering and a diffusion of, of so-called facts, but information itself. Uh, and it's become a little bit of a blizzard of indecipherable stuff. UD recently held a fake news blues forum to explore why Nonsense stories gain traction. Polarization of politics, distrust of the media, newspaper staff cuts, a public that is addicted to social media but lacks the discipline to verify a fairy tale before sharing it. We've developed echo chambers uh, with the two parties in, uh, in America having their own realities or their own efforts to tell their best story. Nicole Dobo writes for the Heckinger Report that explores education issues. It used to be that people could agree on a certain set of facts that they read in their morning papers and then have debates about public policy, but when they can't even agree on the, the basic facts, and when you hear people saying, well, that's not actually true because my opinion is X, Y, Z. Jason Levine of the Wilmington News Journal said the public is too willing to gobble up phony info. In fact, you really need to be challenging yourself to think beyond what your opinion already is. Dobo cites a 2016 Stanford University study that found, for example, that fewer than 10% of high school and college kids realized one website was run by a lobbying group, even though they were allowed to check Google. Folks, that is a 911 emergency. Conrad Schools of Science teacher Lee Weldon is tackling the issue. WHYY sat in on her freshman civics class while students evaluated stories and discussed ways to tell real ones from fakes. Obama signs executive order banning the Pledge of Allegiance in schools nationwide. That is fake, okay? That's, but you know what? Out of all the ones we're looking at, that is the number one shared one. Our top score is 10 out of 12, so every single person in here messed up at least two. 
Students watched a clip of a 60-minute segment on fake news. Then they broke into discussion groups. How many views the fake news gets instead of like real news? Yeah. I also found how people are using fake news to inform the everyday life. As young citizens, they need to learn to understand where their news is coming from, what is credible, so that they can make informed political decisions because they are our future. They're the ones that are going to be part of the elections. They're going to be the ones in the future writing public policy and I want to teach them the key skills right now. I'm still amazed so many people believe stories that defy reality, but that's the world we live in. On the flip side, it's gratifying to see the pushback to, shall we say, re-educate the public. And Chris, I'm glad to see that the schools are being so proactive, but a lot of people do get their news from social media. Are the folks in your story hopeful that the steps that Facebook and others are taking will help stop fake news from going viral in the first place? Well, there's optimism, but it is guarded. Mm -hmm. Many are pleased that so much attention is finally being focused on this mm -hmm. issue. And they're also hoping that students will educate their own families so that fake news can be stopped in its tracks before it infects the public. Okay, well, we'll just have to wait and see. Thank you so much, Chris. More of Chris's Delaware education reporting can be found at newsworks.org slash Delaware. WHYY, the Christina Cultural Arts Center, and the Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League are hosting an event designed to bridge the community by engaging in conversations that may not always be comfortable. The program is called Race, Removing Fences Between Black and White Communities, and it all takes place on Tuesday, May 16th at the Baby Grand. In the studio today, we have Dr. Donald Morton of the Complexities of Color Coalition. Dr. Morton will oversee the breakout session, or one of our breakout sessions, actually. Uh, just want to say thank you for being a part of the program and welcome. Thank you so much. I'm honored all, always to be with you. So I want to get started. You've been active in the community for a long time, and I'm sure you've seen firsthand racial disparities. Why are these conversations so important today? Uh, they're, they're important today because they've really never been properly held. Uh, anytime that a conversation around race ensues, it's always an impolite and uncomfortable conversation. We always get to a place uh, where we, we attempt to have them and then the conversation becomes a little uncomfortable and then we kind of retreat from having the kinds of conversations that really need to take place. Some issues involving race are subtle, some are blatant. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the incident uh, with Adam Jones of the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, some fans at Fenway Park, they threw uh, some peanuts at him and they were just uh, calling him some ugly names. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, I, I, think, I think those things are really low-hanging fruit, right? I, I am not as concerned about racial slurs and commentary that are made by what I consider to be uh, really, really uninformed and ignorant people. What, what I am more concerned about uh, are individuals that are in power and positions of influence that have an ability to create laws and, legis and, and legislative acts that further oppress a group of people because of a skin tone and color. Do you feel the same way about subtle comments? I mean, because say you're at a, in a very expensive store, right? And a salesperson comes up to you and she says, hey, no, I, I think you should go to the discount rack. You can't afford this stuff. What do you have to say about that? Well, uh, yeah, those things don't bother me. Uh, I, I think, uh, th not to suggest at all that they're not problematic, they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we would better spend our energy and time uh, talking about the, uh, the individuals that hold those kinds of ideas dear, those value systems dear, and are in positions of power and influence that get a chance uh, to create laws and policies that act out those biases that, that exist. Whether subtle or blatant. Whether, whether subtle okay. or blatant. Okay, all right, so I recently spoke with B.B. Coker. She's no stranger to protesting yes. racial yes. or social injustices. She says the problem is that people are too judgmental uh, when it comes to race. Now, do you see that when you're out and about in a community? Certainly, uh, uh, there are uh, individuals that are uh, a part of white America that are uh, judgmental. There are people that are a part of black America that are judgmental. But racism, uh, racism and racist acts 
it has to be understood, can only be perpetrated by people in power. Uh, you cannot uh, be racist and you don't hold power. Racism okay. uh, can only be expressed when you're in power. And so uh, my judgmental attitude against somebody in white America has greater, has a lot less influence because I'm not a people group in power in comparison and juxtaposed to an individual that is a part of the dominant culture that can enact that power or that, that bias against a people group. So since I have you here, we understand that removing fences between black and white communities uh, means uncomfortable conversations like you shared, uh, but sometimes is with people who live inside of a box. Yes. A part of what I think our responsibility is, is not just to play the respectability politic, right? That, that I have to live up to a standard that is set by another people group. Uh, but, but I have to be willing to acknowledge uh, not just my own bias, but I've got to acknowledge and, and cause a person in another people group to acknowledge theirs. And when we begin to do that, and when they are willing to embrace the fact that yes, I have bias, yes, I live in a bubble, yes, there are some things I don't understand, and yes, I've been unwilling or unable to bracket, suspend my personal ideas about a person in order to get to know them, and then form uh, my attitudes and understandings about them until they are willing to do that will always be in this situation. The one thing uh, Coker said is that we need to connect with one another. One another. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in order to connect, that means meeting people where they are mm -hmm. in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. is that I, I, I agree with that, but again, uh, I overemphasize the fact that the beginning of that, the genesis of that, the origin of that must begin with white America. Okay. It, it must begin with their willingness to say, let's come to the table, let me seek to understand you, understand what you've been through. Uh, black folk have gone through traumatic experiences for centuries. And uh, there's this attitude, this pervasive attitude that we ought to be over it by now, but we're still encountering the same things over and over again. And once that's acknowledged, then we can begin to have a conversation. Okay, well thanks so much, Dr. Donald Morton of Complexities of Color. Coalition, thanks again for your time. And for those of you at home, don't forget to mark your calendars. The program Race, Removing Fences Between Black and White Communities will take place on May 16th at 6 p.m. at the Baby Grand in Wilmington. And you can register for the event at whyy.org slash events. Click on our event page and we'll see you there. Coming up on First, the Delaware Art Museum takes an idea that is a century in the making and turns it into a new show. And later, the show is over for Leo and Jimmy's. A First tribute is coming up. A lot was made last weekend on the 100-day milestone of the Trump administration. Well, he's not the only one. State of Play time now with Steve Tanzer of DelawareLiberal.net. Steve, thanks for being here. Thank you. Our topic, Governor John Carney's 100th day. Governor Carney's folks put out a, a, a list of uh, accomplishments, a, sort of a checklist. Uh, among those items on the checklist, building a sustainable financial plan, standing up for Delawareans, transitioning Delaware's economy, uh, and addressing prison security. Is that, a, is that a list of successes over, over Carney's first 100 days to you? No, and I don't think, in fairness, that that's really what they released was a list of accomplishments. They released what I think they called a list of initiatives and priorities. Okay. And um, among those accomplishments was that he's held, quote unquote, more than 12 uh, community meetings on the budget reset hosted by more than 24 legislators, that's how he, he put it, um, to tell him what we should do about the budget. Uh, and he has actually introduced a budget which really has not found much favor, especially with the Democrats down in Dover, and I think it's going to be subject to some change. It's an equal 50-50 mix of some revenue increases and budget cuts, including what would appear to be some pretty draconian cuts to education. Where, where um, it's been strongly opposed exactly. in schools. He's appointed reading through the press releases, an independent review, uh, a working group, a task force, and a working council, among other things. So um, I read the, I read it, and I'm like, he re I've said this before, he doesn't appear to have been ready to have been governor when he came in, and he's still trying to find his legs as to what his priorities are. I mean, obviously the prison issue was one that had been around for a long time, but certainly it came to a head sure. with the tragedy 
uh, down at the Vaughan Correctional Center. Um, so I found it to be very, very uh, thin gruel and, and not a list of accomplishments at all. But in fairness, like I said, it's not what they even presented it as. So he has a, you know, really less than two months now before the budget's got to get done and, and he has a chance to get a lot of, a lot of bills or any bills uh, to his desk. Uh, does, does that does he get his way on, on the budget and what he's presented, uh, or is it going to be drastically different two oh, months from now? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be different. I, I think that um, there will have to be more focus on the revenue side. I know that, for example, there's a bill on the agenda that the day that we're recording this that would increase um, taxes on LLCs, uh, which um, is a pet peeve of mine since LLCs are basically like, you can't sue us. We're an LLC. <laughs> right. uh, that's been pretty de rigueur in Delaware. Um, one of the accomplishments he cited really was not one of his, which was the pass of the Ashit Reform Bill. For those of you who get those gift cards, you know, from the supermarket, from the, the, uh, the department stores and sure. stuff, Deller has been claiming the unused portion of that as unclaimed property because of the fact that all of these, uh, these companies are, uh, you know, incorporated registered in Delaware, incorporated right. in Delaware sure. until the other states figured out that we were doing this. And so th this is basically... We had to do this because we, you know, we're going to lose about 99 and 44 and 100 percent of what we were actually claiming there. So that and the other accomplishment he cited, which was not an accomplishment, were several school capital projects, which are, have actually been previously funded. So yeah, I mean, he doesn't have many legislative priorities. So, I mean, and he's not really getting involved in some of the ones that are out there. For example, death penalty repeal is on the um, House uh, committee agenda this week. Right. He said, to well, reinstate the death penalty. Reinstate it. it he, and he's got, well, I, I kind of don't support it, but, you know, if it was for cops, I might be able to. I mean, you know, Le absent without leadership, in my opinion. So if, if that's the, the de facto head of the Democratic Party, let's look at the Republicans then, yeah. who uh, elected a new leader, Michael Harrington, replacing mm -hmm. Charlie Copeland. He's from Kent County, a former legislator a long time ago and now in real estate. Can he kind of pick up the mantle as it was left by Charlie Copeland? I think Charlie Copeland did a good job especially when faced with the challenges that he had. In Mike Harrington, you have a guy who has not been a legislator since 1982. He lost re-election that year and has been out of the political game, except I believe he ran a PAC at one point. So this is 35 years since he last was even involved in the Delaware General Assembly. I've been out of the General Assembly for eight years. If I was asked to run a campaign today, I, I'd be a dinosaur. Right. I couldn't do it. So I have to think that this is essentially a case of uh, nobody else wanting the job. All right, well, I'll leave it there. Uh, lots to talk about before the end of June. Steve Tanzer, DelawareLiberal.net. Thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. Two years ago, we told you a story about a Wilmington church asking the community to help rebuild their 60-year-old pipe organ. Well, they did it with help from hundreds of people. We revisit the Episcopal Church of St. Andrew and Matthew for an update. Take a listen. The music fills the sanctuary of the Episcopal Church of Saints Andrew and Matthew. Pipe organs tend to give the effect that the whole room is the organ. The 2,897 pipes represent the three parishes that now make up Sam. St. Matthew's and St. John's joined St. Andrew's when their parishes closed. Pipes from the three different parishes make up the organ you see today. I think all the people that were from those parishes sort of lament the fact that those don't exist anymore, but at the same time they're happy about this new incarnation of them. It all started five years ago when the church launched the Sharing Our Blessings campaign. The church needed money to not only renovate their kitchen, but also to restore their organ, which had seen better days. The kitchen to help us with our ministry with the community, the organ with our commitment to creative liturgies and being a center for music in the community. Campaign Chair Pat Saunders set out to raise more than $1.3 million. As of May 15th, Sam exceeded their goal by $100,000. This has been a truly roller coaster ride. And, we, and we've had really down moments and really up moments. I laid in bed many nights and wondered how we were going to get anything. In addition to grant money, Saunders says $100,000 was raised through sponsoring a pipe for the organ in honor of a loved one. When you hear the organ played, 
and you have given a pipe for a loved one, that loved one is still with you in the music, in that sanctuary, in that space. In all, more than 450 people contributed, giving as little as $5 or as much as $200,000. Everybody gave what little they could, or a lot that they could, but they, together it has made the culmination of this wonderful organ here today. The Catherine Esther Lee organ was dedicated in February. It's named after the well-known pediatrician, community leader, and longtime member of SAM. And there are still opportunities to sponsor a pipe in honor of a loved one. Go to SAM.org to find out how. In 1917, a group of artists decided to change the way art exhibits worked. Their idea was that anyone could show their work, and for only $5, you could have your art displayed in a gallery show in New York City. The group was called the Society of Independent Artists. The group lasted until 1944, but the artwork lives on at the Delaware Art Museum. Check out our first experience. The Society of Independent Artists were a group of artists who came together to exhibit their work in the early 20th century. They were founded to exhibit their work independently of museums and galleries. Artists were really looking for new ways to show their work. Artists experimenting with different styles that maybe weren't so mainstream, weren't so popular, really needed new ways. And this gave the chance for any artist who could pay the initiation fee of $5 to show two works in a giant exhibition in New York. The Society of Independent Artist Shows were enormous. Hundreds and hundreds of works. The first year in 1917, depending on whose version you believed, it was either a mile of pictures to look at or two miles of pictures to look at. Over the course of the, the exhibitions from 1917 to 1944, over 6,000 artists showed. The show was hung alphabetically. It was based on a French tradition, starting with a letter picked at random. It allowed for a great democracy of how it was hung. That way you didn't have a hanging committee making decisions about what got hung up high, maybe what went over a doorway, or what got hung in a dark corner. It was all very democratic, but also very random. We did this here as well. We picked the letter K. Uh, someone picked it out of a hat at a staff meeting, and it gave us a chance to sort of replicate that randomness. It led to some interesting juxtapositions with artists who were working in very different styles but around, of course, the same time period. It really was a surprising diversity of styles. I think of this group coming out of Sloan and Glackens and the Ashpan School, and many, many of their students exhibited in these shows. So you had a lot of really major American realist painters showing. But you also have artists who are very much in tune with what's happening in Europe. It's an incredibly vibrant period in American art. them to see the diversity of art that's happening in the 1920s and 1930s in the United States and the mix of artists who you've heard of who are famous and then also artists you've never heard of who might be making really compelling work and hopefully it will inspire it certainly has inspired me to do a lot more research on some of those artists. The Delaware Art Museum is getting ready for a big exhibit of John Sloan's work in the fall. He was one of the founders of the Society of Independent Artists. We'll be sure to bring that to you. And next week, we head back to the museum to introduce you to a mostly unknown artist, at least here in the U.S. But in England, the work of W. Heath Robinson is well known. We'll introduce you to his work. It's the end of an era for downtown Wilmington's well-known deli shop, Leo and Jimmy's. After 87 years, the last sandwich was sold Friday. As the lights dim and the door closes for the last time, the memories left behind will not fade from the hearts of those who frequent in the sandwich shop over the many years. Leo and Jimmy's. Their name is synonymous with downtown Wilmington and Good Eats. Word of their closing didn't go down easy. I am so broken hearted because I've been coming here for a decade. The original owners, Leo Rosenbaum and Jimmy Hackett, have since passed away, but their story dates back some 87 years. 
Leo started his deli counter in 1930 at the Silver's 5 and 10 cent store. After returning from the armed services, 20-year-old Jimmy went to work for Leo and soon became manager of that deli counter. That working relationship led to a partnership, and the two operated deli counters at various Market Street locations, including Wilmington Dry Goods and Kresge's. Barbara Hackett, Jimmy's wife and now store owner, remembers how the deli counter became a deli shop. And the first sandwich Jimmy ever made over in Kresge's, somebody said to him, well, you have bologna and you have cheese, you have bread, can't you make me a sandwich? And that's what started it. In 1972, Leo and Jimmy opened their own shop, and in 74, the business moved to its current location at 728 North Market Street. Sherry Hackett, Jimmy's daughter, reminisces about her early years at the deli. I do remember them moving here, because uh, it was my birthday. <laughs> uh, I was six. The day starts early for her and her mother. There's the 4.30 a.m. arrival of freshly baked rolls from Amoroso's. Everything is fresh. <laughs> Those rolls are followed by the paper delivery, and the sun hasn't even made its appearance before the regular customers start coming in for that morning cup of joe, and it's only around 5.30 in the morning. But the commotion doesn't stop there. While Mrs. Hackett is prepping for the day, the rest of the daily deliveries arrive and the morning moves along. Before you know it, morning has made its way to lunchtime and the pressure picks up. Sherry's back on the grill while the ladies take over the counter. Customers keep piling in. I moved to Delaware in 1994 and I've been coming here since then. I used to work at AIG and we all would come here and get sandwiches and the macaroni and cheese. That's why I'm here today. It's the best. <laughs> Word of the closing spread fast, and folks flock to the deli to get their favorites before it closes officially. While I was in town, I walked about three blocks, or three blocks, so I can come here and get my sandwiches in case I get brains or before May the 5th. Customers say it's more than good eats that keeps them coming back. Everyone here is super friendly. They all knew my name within like a week of me coming over here. They had my order down memorized. Sherry Hackett believes the friendly atmosphere is what made her parents' deli so popular. This was, is more than a sandwich shop. It, it's, it's like a, a really good neighbor. In addition to serving sandwiches, Mrs. Hackett says her husband had a love for the people of Wilmington and went out of his way to help people. Whenever anybody wanted anything on the mall, they always called Jimmy. They called him Mayor of Marcus Street. <laughs> Mrs. Hackett carried that tradition on with her customers. Just like one day, some guy said, what do you have, $3? And he said, what can I give for $3? I said, whatever you want. So we made him a sub for $3. And then I said, just keep your $3. <laughs> you might need it for something else. Mrs. Hackett says some customers think they're just relocating, but this is really it. The time was right, and so she accepted an offer from the Bacini Poland Group to purchase the deli and the neighboring building, which she also owns. She's grateful for the years they've been able to serve the people of Wilmington. I'd just like to thank all my customers for their support all through the years. I guess that's why we've been here so long. Wilmington City Council recently recognized Leo and Jimmy's for their service throughout the years. Members of the Hackett family and their friends were present. So what's next for Barbara Hackett? Well, she turns 72 this August and has lots of home projects she'd like to complete now that she has a little more time on her hands. She and her daughter have also joked about hitting the road with a food truck. <laughs> That's a good idea and job well done to them. Well, next week on First, Muslim Americans in Delaware are expressing themselves more. Is this a reaction to the Trump administration or a way for a community to evolve? And we offer some reflections to a tough week for Delaware law enforcement. That is first for this week. We thank you so much for watching. Don't forget, if you want to sign up for our forum on race, go to whyy.org slash events. For Shirley Men and Mark Eichmann, I'm Michelle Polston. Have a great week.